yeah, the live stream doesn't work. So I don't know, technology. All right, uh, let's get started then. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. This is DD London. Uh, tonight we'll have Savas, who is the head of engineering at Parcel Vision. Uh, Savas will present us the ARC42, which is an approach to documenting the software architecture. I was personally interested in that, so I asked around if someone wants to do a presentation, and here we are. Have uh, 30, nearly 30 people on the call, so that's great. I'm also recording that uh, presentation, so hopefully I'll be able to upload that later in the absence of the live stream. Uh, right, so a couple of ground rules. Feel free to use chat uh, as Savas as presents or ask questions on the chat, but we'll be, uh, he will be answering and addressing the questions after, after he's done with the presentation, and I will be also uh, able to uh, let you speak after the presentation so we can have an actual discussion. For, for now, you are muted. Uh, but if you have any questions, just feel free to pick me on the chat and I will I'll do my best to answer them. All right, that's it from me then. Savas, off to you. Hi, uh, thank you, Kasper. And uh, so before we start, uh, I'd like to thank you and, and DDD London for uh, having me today. And uh, the talk today is uh, basically an introduction about ARC42. Um, the schedule of this talk is uh, we're going to be seeing in the first uh, part of this talk about um, roughly what ARC42 is uh, and what it isn't, of course, and, 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 and some assessment whether um, this is something that you would uh, want to um, use or not. Um, then we're going to be going into uh, what ARC42 is made up of, all the different sections that it uh, comprises ARC42, and seeing a little bit in greater detail about the uh, what information goes into different sections. Um, and, and the idea here is that by the end of section two, you should yeah, be able to have a, um, get a head start with uh, adopting an ARC42 and start authoring architectural documentations using ARC42. Uh, and then the final section of this talk, I'm just going to be explaining a little bit, discussing a little bit about using ARC42 in, in different uh, environments, in different contexts. So, uh, so would you go about using ARC42 in a startup environment and so on? Um, and um, so what is ARC42? So ARC42 basically uh, is an accessible template for authoring architectural documentation. It, and Really, frankly, that's, that, that, that describes it quite accurately. Um, there are templates that you can download. There are different templates for different file formats. So you can download ones for, uh, for uh, word files and markdown files, but there are enough that, uh, that can help you. But even if you cannot find a particular format that uh, works best for you, uh, as a template, I mean, you, it's very easy to reproduce uh, within the tool that, that, that works better for you in your particular context. It is also uh, worth it to mention what ARC42 is not. Um, ARC42 isn't an architecture. Uh, it, it is a template to author the architecture and communicate that architecture, um, but it is not an architecture in and of itself. So it fits quite well because of that being characteristic it fits quite well in different environments. So it doesn't matter if you are working with monolithic applications, it doesn't matter if you are working in enterprises, it doesn't matter if you are working with uh, microservices and distributed teams, ARC42 can work uh, within those environments quite nicely. Um, it is now the modeling tool and as well may make work to uh, explain that ARC42 is not uh, a silver bullet for, for documentation. Um, although it does help you quite nicely, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that point later on. So, should you use and should you adopt ARC42? Before I ask, answer this question, I like to go over the different kinds of problems that I experienced uh, in my, uh, in, in my uh, previous professional um, um, life uh, in different positions and different companies. So first up, most common situation out there um, that I experienced was that Documentation is not there. I mean, either uh, you join a company and the company is 
either it's small or it's a startup environment or they don't have a dedicated architect to offer the documentation and the documentation is just missing or the documentation is actually there but it's not accessible and it's not uh, something that developers have access to uh, for whatever reason. It may be because it's a regulated environment and the information there is guarded. It may be for whatever reason that um, the architectural documentation is not accessible to the people building the system that is supposed to actually meet those architectural um, and, and meet that architecture. So this is obviously an unhealthy situation that, uh, that we want to avoid. Next up, my experience with documentation in startups is that there isn't exactly an architectural documentation again, uh, but in this time, uh, because we kind of feel the pain, um, teams tend to generally um, retain all of the artifacts of the different modeling exercises or for the different workshops that they run, any requirement extraction. So uh, they tend to keep this information. It's just the problem is that it's a lot of information. It's spread across uh, different documents potentially. It may be in formats that are not easily uh, um, discoverable and consumable. And, and that is, again, an equally unhealthy uh, situation. Um, it doesn't matter if you are using uh, user story mapping along with um, I don't know, event sourcing and if you have, uh, if you start off with all of the discussions in tickets in Jira or in, in Confluence in pages, not having some structure and, and not having this information uh, in one place that is easily, easily discoverable, uh, in essence gets you back to the previous problem. So it doesn't matter if you don't have it or if it's there but you cannot find it. Uh, it, it's the same kind of problem. The other kind of problem that I experienced were in situations with, where formal documentation existed. Uh, so this was in a couple of companies that accepted uh, European Union, EU uh, larger projects, is that as developers, you only got a sliver of the documentation. So documentation was there and it was actually quite thorough, um, but developers only got to see a tiny part of that documentation. And then sometimes that, that, that small part of the documentation was seen by uh, sharing some uh, parts of, of, of locked uh, documents or um, copy pasting of some information or even worse um, through uh, tickets that got offered by a business analyst who spoke to someone else. And, and, and that kind of exhibited a broken telephone um, problem on top of not having a, a better idea of the context of or where your work uh, is going to be um, uh, living in and uh, interacting with all of the different systems and, and the, the behavior. And, and, and yes, Agile and the different uh, development processes that we came up with trying to address this, but I mean, communication is um, verbal communication specifically, I mean, and, 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 and interacting with people uh, is not a good replacement um, for uh, good architectural documentation. So if you spoke with someone and found something out, it, 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 you're basically going to be paying the same cost for uh, and multiplied by the number of people that you have. So you know, great, does anyone else that know the same piece of information? All of your rest of the team knows. So again, different kinds of problems because of different kinds of situations. And then Finally, another situation is that when you actually do get access to that, uh, the, to some of the um, more verbose and complete documentation that is, uh, well, I, I accept that that may have been necessary for some of the bigger projects uh, for uh, from the EU part, and, and they were quite thorough and expansive. This, the sheer size of information that was inside made the uh, documentation itself useless. Uh, you couldn't discover the necessary information that you needed. And again, architectural documentation is not for the consumption of the architect. So architectural documentations are definitely going to be used by the architect, yes, but the architect is not the only person that needs to consume this. Uh, this these are the stuff, that, stuff that need to be shared across. Um, so, and, um, so not to sidetrack really, but uh, so this was a, a tweet from uh, Grady Bush yesterday, uh, so which said that a diagram is a reflection, a whisper, if you will, of only one view of the system's true architecture. So um, this basically uh, very well reflects the um, my my point of view with regards to this. 
So storing diagrams and, and basically describes the problem in the startup environment that I was saying earlier. Um, uh, a diagram alone doesn't convey all of the necessary information um, for uh, to describe the system architecture. And, and, and this is where um, I think we can and should do better than, than, than all of the, um, that what we have so far. Uh, we need documentation that is accessible. We need documentation that is low ceremony, easy to maintain. Um, you need documentation that is thorough enough. So maybe thorough will be worth there in my slide is, um, I should, should add to this, but we need documentation that is thorough enough uh, without being too, um, too expensive. So to still be accessible, to still maintain the accessible um, behavior. Uh, but also extensible because we need to be able to uh, utilize those things, uh, to utilize this template in different contexts. So we need to be able to use it uh, within a startup environment, to be able to use it if, if that startup grows and naturally expands. So even, even if we choose, for example, a more traditional um, documentation template and, and certain guidelines to um, meet our current needs, uh, those needs may not stay the same for, for all periods of time. And that's why I think R42 actually makes quite a lot of sense. R42 exhibits all of these desirable behaviors. It is accessible, no ceremony. Uh, it helps us be thorough. And, and, it's, it, and I think greatly exhibits a kind of pit of success um, uh, pattern uh, by how the different sections are structured and what it's supposed to be adding into those different sections. And also, it's meant to be extensible. Um, so without further ado, let's go into the different sections of R42 uh, and um, see what you should be adding into uh, each section. So section one is um, the introduction and goals. So a common thing here that you will be uh, seeing is that the, uh, the titles of these sections are uh, probably a good idea of what you're supposed to be adding in those sections. Um, so section one is, uh, as the title says, uh, just an introduction on on the project and the product and, and, and the goals of this project. Um, we, we're providing an overview of the requirements and the, uh, some the most important quality goals that we have for this particular project and uh, a table with the stakeholders that are involved in this particular project. Um, I would say this is generally something that is, uh, that, that, that at, at least personally I find it uh, missing in a lot of environments, so mostly startups tend to miss this information and just think that, hey, we're just a small bunch of people, so why do we need this kind of information written down? Um, but, but it is quite useful because startups don't stay startups for a long period of time. And, and even if they do, after that long period of time, uh, people change. And it's useful to actually have this documented somewhere and just, uh, if importantly, no other reason, um, to keep a focus and an understanding of what we're trying to be building here. Um, some tips about this, uh, I will say, as I said earlier, try to keep this approachable, keep this as a summary um, of, this, of this section. Don't, don't, don't expand on all of the different parts. So in the quality goals, for example, uh, don't expand and add all of them. There is an, an additional section about, um, about quality goals, for example. Um, and obviously requirements will be expanded earlier, but just focus on the important bits here, on the most important bits. Use diagrams, uh, it's easier to understand, um, uh, they're easier to, uh, for communication, for other people to consume. And another thing is uh, try to use concrete examples for uh, some of uh, both of the requirements and some of the uh, quality goals. Um, Again, do put the effort and, and, and try to um, fill this in, in an adequate uh, size. So if you're in a startup, do put the effort to fill it in. But of course, I mean, you don't need to expand it in and, 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 and spend too much time on it. Uh, section two is architectural constraints. So these are things that restrict our, restrict our options. Uh, we have a set of requirements already that, um, at least the more important bits that we mentioned, uh, these are things that we, we need to acknowledge. Uh, this may be environmental um, constraints that we have, environmental constraints from the perspective of um, the environment that, that our, our system is going to be working in. Um, so think about, I mean, I, I, an example that I think is, is, is quite um, indicative of this is, uh, so we're going to be building um, a, a mobile applications, for example. So we need to cater for a partially connected client. 
and, and, and that, that some of our clients would not be um, all of the time online and be able to communicate so with some of the server side um, applications. These constraints may be political, organizational, so you need to have um, to cater for uh, two different departments that need to be able to uh, deliver their work uh, independently of one another, not causing any uh, block, not um, not having one blocking the deliveries of the second team. But they also may be technical constraints. Technical constraints are like um, skill set based, for example, or uh, skill availability. Uh, it may be hosting environments, uh, any kind of that. So, if, for example, if our team has experience with SQL Server and they don't have any experience with supporting any other kind of database, uh, this, this is something that needs to go into the architecture of constraint. I would say this is one of the sections that we do want to be thorough um, and try to identify as much of the architecture of constraints that, that, that you can find and definitely review as the things as, as time goes by. So some of the uh, constraints, for example, are <clears throat> some of the uh, technical constraints, for example, may stop being um, a stop apply after a certain period of time. Um, section three goes is, is, is basically context and scope. This is an overview of our, um, not just our system, but our system side by side with its neighbors and its users. Uh, so, it's a good um, it's a good diagram. Uh, so it's a good section, and I, I think so. Personally, I, I tend to uh, dedicate a lot of time to make sure that this section is is okay. I mean, it's not the biggest section in my architectural documentation, but it's certainly one that I um, I, I pay a lot of uh, I, I put a lot of effort in. Um, it, it, it's it's supposed to be uh, providing that overview of the ecosystem, as I mentioned. Um, but explicitly also um, um, speaking about the communication, the dependencies and the public interfaces of, of, of our, at, at the system level. Um, we will be seeing how our users interact, what they are doing, what kind of data, at least for the important interactions, um, are, are being transferred into and out of our system. Uh, we, are, we want to keep, so the, the overview here is that the system is a black box. Um, and, and, and we're just seeing how things interact. So we are still uh, outside the scope of the um, outside our system and we're viewing the, the environment. And one comment I have is that this can be conveyed quite nicely uh, through diagrams again. And um, <clears throat> one particular uh, example of diagrams that, um, that helps quite a lot in this case is the C4 system context diagram. So the C4 system context diagrams align quite nicely with the information that's supposed to be conveyed in this section. Um, I, I don't know if you're familiar with C4, but um, I, I, the C4 system, the C4 is made up of four different levels uh, of, um, of uh, architectural documentation that, that provides different perspectives. And the system context is exactly what we explained earlier in this particular section. It's C4 is very easy to consume uh, and it's also easy to offer. There are a lot of uh, tools that allow you to do so um, and, and, and I would definitely suggest using some um, using these diagrams. In addition to uh, context and scope uh, that, that, that I would suggest you consider uh, that is not part of the R42 uh, templates is the business model canvas. So the business model canvas um, is uh, a, 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 a tool that we start using in domain-driven design uh, to describe a, a bounded context. And it's, sorry, so the business model canvas, not the bounded context canvas, sorry, I missed, <laughs> my mistake. So the business model canvas. So the business model canvas is, a, again, a tool that we use now um, to describe uh, the business and how the business is delivering value to the customers. Again, this is uh, it's, it's not strictly part of the context and scope, but it is providing an understanding of what kind of value and interactions the business has with the customers. So it, 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 it aligns quite well with the um, incentive here um, and, and what we are trying to uh, convey. I would also suggest adding any modeling artifacts that make sense in your particular case. So for example, um, something that I will consider adding here is uh, and using adding domain storytelling um, diagrams. So domain storytelling is uh, something similar to uh, user stories, um, but created in a graphical manner. 
and you will see the users interacting with the systems in a sequence of interactions. So in some respect, they are closer to activity diagrams, but if we keep the domain storytelling on a very high level, it actually provides a lot of um, insight on um, how the users are interacting with our system and what kind of value do they provide. So keeping those domain storytelling on a very high level, it does align with, uh, with this particular section and provides um, a missing, in my um, uh, perspective, uh, piece of information. Um, Section four is the solution strategy. So uh, this is supposed to be a summary of the important decisions um, of, of our system. Um, <clears throat> so this is not exactly an ADR, just to be, uh, to be clear, but it does provide some of that information um, inside. So uh, we will be discussing about, uh, sorry, we will be adding uh, information about what the decision is, um, why did we make some of those decisions, some of the alternatives that we, um, uh, that, that, that we considered. We are going to be um, providing all of that documentation here. However, only the important bits. So the information that goes into this section should clearly explain, should, uh, should make some of the important bits of the architectures that are documented in subsequent sections um, more clear, so it, it, it's con context to them, context to those decisions. Um, they will sort of explain those decisions. Um, it makes sense also to be able to link the decisions that are documented here um, back to the goals and constraints. And, and it's useful to use this in section nine, so se section nine is the section where we um, uh, have the additional um, architectural sort of the, additional decisions that we took in this architecture is, is useful to um, link them back to the consistent goals and use them as kind of a checklist. So put the very important here so that it, 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 we understand why certain the subsequent sections will look like that uh, and delegate all of the less important uh, decisions to, uh, to section nine. Um, section five is the building blocks view. So the building blocks view is where you will add information about the static view of your system. I'm referring to static view from the perspective of UML. So we will be seeing about the system and, and basically the idea here is that uh, we starting from the top level and the system is the um, alliance to the uh, C4 system context diagrams that, that I already explained. Uh, so where our system lives, uh, where our system lives with its neighbors, so it's dependent uh, systems and then the, um, the users using our system. So we present that, but don't stay on that level. We open the system up and, and then we show the services that made up, that make up our, our system. And that is the level one view, or the level one building blocks view. In the level one, we open the system up and we treat it as a white box and describe the services uh, that, that make up that. And then we pick some of the important services and open those up and then we show the components that make up those services, and that's the level two diagram. Um, so I, if you are familiar with C4, you will um, see that this is um, the level one and level two closely um, uh, correlate with uh, C4 containers and C4 components. So level one uh, is the C4 container uh, diagrams, and level two is the, the, the C4 component diagrams. Um, don't only use diagrams. I, I would strongly suggest that uh, you do use diagrams, but as well provide some textual information uh, to explain all of the different things that make up that white box of the, of the different levels. So in level one, for example, we are opening our system and we are maybe seeing it that is made up of, um, so let's see uh, this, this example, for example. So uh, this is taken from the um, documentation of R42, by the way. So the top level one is the system context diagram, um, or would be the C4 central context diagram, where we see the users, we see our system, we see its neighbors. We are opening it up and viewing the internals of our system in level one. Uh, we are treating the internals as black boxes within level one and providing information uh, about what each box is, uh, is doing and, and, and the interactions that it has with the different services, the uh, interfaces that, um, the public interfaces that it has, and, and, and how it works. 
uh, and then from there we're picking some of the important ones and then opening them up as white boxes in level two so it's it's important to note here that this can get quite big especially if we are developing a bigger system if we try to be thorough this will expand to multiple pages this is something that we want to avoid we want to keep this section um, again the idea is keeping it in, in providing enough information that we can understand what's going on and we can everybody um, who is uh, who can benefit from this documentation to be able to really understand and, and do the, what they are supposed to be doing um, but, but, but at the same time small enough to allow them to do so so have enough information and but curate it so that it's it's not too much so that information is lost um, I definitely suggest using uh, tables for example if you are uh, to describe each each section and then tables allow you to um, filter and just focus on what is important blocks of text is usually more difficult to consume um, but um, overall again it is going to be um, most commonly it's going to be a, a rather large uh, section um, some of the uh, things that I would add to this particular section that I um, we see that uh, some of the workshops that we do and that create valuable artifacts that we want to keep around and actually link to this particular section uh, is, for example, the bounded context mark my canvas that I mentioned earlier by mistake. So the bounded context canvas does fit quite nicely here. So bounded context canvas, depending on how the bounded context is implemented, it will either be uh, a service or it will either be, uh, so it's going to be a container or a component. Um, so according to how it's implemented, but having the bounded context canvas here provides additional context, which is quite useful to uh, everyone working in the uh, in the product team. Another final thing is that, uh, so for, from specifically speaking about C4, C4 code level diagrams aren't um, aren't uh, are, are, are not recommended. They're not recommended because things change drastically at the code level. So you will spend a lot of amount of time uh, maintaining those things. And, and also at the same time, it provides quite well, not enough value. Arc 42 is actually really good in this regard in that um, we keep, well, I'll keep that to the next, uh, to the other section that, that really relates to um, okay. code specifically. But this particular section also, if we, if we add the aggregate design canvas, the aggregate design canvas is actually a, a really good trade-off of being close to code but presenting valuable and useful information. So uh, when we come up and, uh, with the aggregates in our system, aggregates are important things, important implementers and containers of business logic. And the aggregate design canvas is a very useful tool uh, to document and communicate um, those responsibilities and contracts. Um, before I move forward to section six, uh, another thing that I would like to say is that, um, uh, sorry, basically let me go. Yeah, anyway, okay, so basically the, I'm, I'm, the just that the aggregate design canvas is, is enough. We're going to be meeting the, um, I'm going to be discussing uh, section, uh, in subsequent sections, sorry about that. Um, so the mirror view of uh, section six, the section five is section six, it's the, the, the runtime view. So the, this is the dynamic aspects of, of our system. So while in section five, we presented a lot of the static views and the contracts of our, um, of our uh, services and components. In section six, we will be describing the dynamic aspects from the perspective of UML again. So we're gonna be discussing about and documenting uh, use cases, we're gonna be documenting workflows, we're gonna be documenting interactions and uh, happy and sad parts. Um, this is, um, this with section five should give uh, enough information for software developers to um, uh, start implementation, but also at the same time um, guide uh, enough of the um, some of the testing that is uh, that is needed to happen. Um, again, this is another um, um, another section where it's uh, diagrams heavy. 
Um, and uh, we can definitely use sequence diagrams and activity diagrams, especially considering that this is the uh, dynamic aspect of the view. And they very, uh, um, very naturally uh, can describe uh, some of the intent in this particular section. But on top of that, I would suggest using, uh, adding some links to process level event storming here. So if we, if we consider what process level event storming really is, uh, it, it's basically a model of the system in, in motion where, where uh, we have a lot of commands coming from uh, users which um, cause certain events uh, to get raised and certain events um, other components in other system may be um, consuming those events, doing, running their own business logic and making their own decisions and raising subsequent events. So in essence, this is very close to, um, and it's a complementary, I will say, to the, uh, um, the sequence and activity diagrams. So either, so if you're using Miro, for example, either um, add a link to uh, the event sorting sessions or, or just simply add a, uh, a picture of the um, event storming sessions that we have. After that is the deployment view. Uh, deployment view is the most well-known aspect of architecture. In mean, most of my previous positions, um, whenever I got to see deployment, uh, sorry, whenever I got to see architectural diagrams, nine times out of 10, it was just a deployment view. Uh, and I, it's a pretty well-known uh, aspect. Uh, Having said that, it's also quite valuable again. So there was a reason that this was the, uh, the most well-known version, uh, sorry, um, aspect of architecture. So um, we just want to document the uh, technical infrastructure here and, 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 and be able to uh, explain any of the uh, document, any of the decisions made about uh, the hardware that are going to be running, uh, the services that we're going to be building. Um, and again, uh, being able to uh, map any of the building blocks that we created to the hardware that, that's going to be done in those environments. Like we want to show, um, to document everything that is relating to, uh, to the deployment view. Again, it's pretty known, so I won't be, uh, I'm not going to be spending a lot of time on this particular uh, section. Um, don't uh, feel free to uh, link out this uh, outside of this document, by the way. So if you, uh, uh, if there is, uh, an external repository of uh, um, that gets automatically generated, for example, uh, so you have some diagrams automatically generated, if you to link to that as well from this section. But yeah, other than that, I don't have anything else to, um, um, to add to that part. Now, section eight is its concept, is the one that I was, um, um, I wanted to discuss a little bit earlier. So the concept here is, uh, so concept as in conceptual integrity, yeah. Um, this is referring to uh, uniformity and cohesion of, uh, of our solution and, and of our um, implementation um, and the architecture itself in, in some regard. So this is why I, I subtitled this, uh, this section as the pattern language of our solution. Um, it's, it, it's supposed to document and explain and describe any cross-cutting concerns uh, any decisions about uh, cross-cutting concern um, within our system, any decisions, architectural decisions um, that manifest in multiple aspects in our system. And, 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 and this is a very, very important part uh, of, of, of R42. Um, I will say this is also the, probably the only place where uh, source code actually matters and, and makes sense. Um, of course, source code, not in the sense of uh, like copy pasting code, although if that makes sense for you, that's, that's probably fine. I, I mean, the pseudocode is also quite adequate. The idea is conveying how something should be done. Um, if we are, I, so an example would be that uh, we decide that we are only persisting our, um, our right path domain models, we're going to be using one-off event sourcing and um, document events across the system, and we won't be using anything else for uh, whatever reason. So this is a place to actually um, document these two approaches so that if somebody um, picks up something new, 
uh, they are uh, immediately able to recognize it and, and start working on it, well, maybe not immediately, but at least they won't have a, a, to pay a, a cost of getting up to date and also reduce the amount of bugs that we will have because um, they have locally implemented something that is sl slightly different than what they find um, uh, next in their approach. And, and, and this is quite problematic in a lot of cases. So this section actually addresses this problem quite nicely. And, and, and I, I definitely suggest that um, you pay attention, attention sorry, uh, to this section. Um, a small sidetrack, well, not quite so a sidetrack again, uh, cross country concerns are a really important aspect of your system. So definitely do not uh, underestimate this section. And I have a quote from Fred Brooks, which I, I, I really like, which says, I will contend that conceptual integrity is the most important consideration in system design. It is better to have a system of meet certain anomalous features and improvements, but to reflect one set of design ideas than to have one that contains many good, but independent and uncoordinated ideas. And he said that in 1975, by the way, so, and, 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 and he, uh, he repeated the same thing closer to, the, to 2000. So it's, uh, I, and I totally agree with that aspect. I mean, very, it's, it's very rare that we actually have trivial systems. If we are considering to, um, if, if we have a team of developers working on something for any period of time, it implicitly is complex enough that conceptual integrity would make sense. And we always have, uh, cross-cutting concerns. So it, it, I, and these are things that we need to address basically is what I'm trying to explain. And, and, and I'm just trying to convince you to, uh, to make the effort and, and, and complete this diagram. Um, then we have architectural decisions. So this is the section that, the, the section that I was referring to uh, earlier, which uh, is basically the, uh, closely relates to ADRs. Um, so it's not quite an ADR, um, but, but it, it, it is meant to uh, have uh, a lot of the same information inside. So uh, context about the decision, cost of those decisions, alternatives considered, um, and, and explaining why that decision was made and, and what, does it, what does it do and what it is. Um, uh, again, we should aim to focus on the important and expensive decisions here and document the ones that apply. If you want to keep an ADR, um, definitely do that. Do that somewhere else. Link to that uh, that store and document the important bits here. So the idea of Art 42 is to give, um, again, keeping it small so that it's easily consumable and, and be able to give people all of the necessary information to do their function. If somebody wants to do an analysis and see, uh, so previous, uh, previous decisions, for example, so how, a particular decision change through time, they can do that somewhere else. That, that's okay. I mean, it's, it's not the purpose of, of, of this document to do this. Um, and another comment that I would like to have is that if you are have, if, if some decisions are very localized by their nature, uh, I would suggest preferring to document those decisions near the effect. So if, they, uh, if, if a decision affects a block view, um, prefer to put it near the effect in section five. So where this is, um, what this is affecting, explain why that looks like that. Um, it's, if, if, if you wouldn't want to do that, by the way, for um, uh, anything that is not localized. So anything that's not localized should, should be here. If something is inherently localized, uh, I suggest you put that near the, intent, near the effect. So, now we have uh, the section 10, which is the uh, set of quality goals. And this is a more thorough list of quality requirements that um, a, a, a more thorough set of quality requirements than the ones that we have in section 1.2. Um, this is one of the few places in r 42 where we are meant to be quite thorough and, and go through all of that list in detail and document everything. And, and, and that goes back to what I was mentioning earlier about um, linking this um, back and, and, and using this as a checklist. Uh, all of this need to be addressed somehow. So if we have 
a, a set of non-conflicting quality requirements, we need to make sure that we address them. If some of the quality requirements, for whatever reason, are actually conflicting, we need to document why here, make sure that that, that is addressed. So why we made some particular trade-off in those cases needs to be addressed. Um, I, I will suggest that, so this kind of makes sense as a table, but also consider adding um, using quality scenarios, so uh, writing things like um, if I'm a user and I want to uh, do this thing, I expect that this takes less than like I don't know, 10 hours to finish or something like that. So this is, is better conveys the information and intent, but also uh, is easier to understand and also can then subsequently, as I mentioned earlier, drive uh, some of the automated tests that we have. Uh, I, I won't go into any uh, detail, but I just wanted to mention the quality attribute utility tree, um, which uh, also fits nicely in the in section 10. And quality attribute utility tree is kind of a, a mind map um, that groups uh, certain um, quality requirements under certain sections and, and, and expand uh, from there. Um, Section 11 is a, a risk and technical debt, so like a risk, a risk registry. Um, the only tip I have here is uh, is linked it back to the stakeholders. So you want to have um, to have the risks documented somewhere and and, and and keep an eye on those risks, and because they are important, obviously, but also link back to the stakeholders so that you know if for some reason you are not meeting. Uh, or you are in the risk of actually um, uh, falling uh, afoul of something, you actually know who the stakeholder is and, and you can go and discuss and, and make decisions. The final section of R42 is glossary, and uh, this is a good place for our ubiquitous language. Um, it, it's meant to provide a description of the important terms uh, in the service. Uh, and, and that closely aligned to the language and domain room design. So it's, it's, it's a natural fit. And I do suggest you fill this section in this, um, uh, with this. I, I will suggest structuring by bound context so that we don't have, um, so we have that visibility and understanding of so this term under this bounded context with something else, or at least group, sorry, uh, by bounded context. And the same term in the other bounded context means something slightly different and document the differences here, uh, especially for the important parts, for the important parts. Finally, ARC 42 in context. So that, that was ARC 42. I hope you found this uh, useful, uh, and I hope that uh, you are now able to uh, start using ARC 42 to author your architectural documentation. Um, a little bit of comments regarding uh, using ARC 42 uh, in different environments. So using Act 42 within or uh, while applying domain-driven design. Uh, saying that it's entirely orthogonal is kind of a tautology because Act 42 is an uh, architectural documentation template. Domain-driven design is a set of principles and practices and patterns. It's, it, it, it's, it's orthogonal in that respect. But on the other hand, I mean, from a different point of view, Art 42 doesn't necessarily cater for uh, some of the uh, workshops and the artifacts that they generate uh, and that are becoming uh, more and more popular um, because they are valuable and, and, and we should be uh, doing them. Uh, having said that though, Art42 is supposed to be uh, extensible and it's in, in, in that way, even though it doesn't cater for those artifacts by default, we can certainly uh, include some of those, in the, of those artifacts in the places where they make sense. So add to this documentation and within the sections that make sense, the artifacts that we want to, that you want to keep around. Um, so I already made some of the suggestions. Um, we can discuss a little bit further in the Q&A that we have by the end of the day, if, if, if you have any further questions on this. Using Act 42 in startups and, and, and smaller organizations. So should you use Act 42 in startups and smaller orgs? The question really should be, do you need to uh, offer architectural documentation anyway in startups and smaller orgs? I will say generally that yes, it's a good idea, but of course, uh, 
considering the situation, maybe not. I mean, if you are just two or three people working together in a garage, then skipping it, it's not going to have a great effect on you. Uh, as you grow, though, you will find that you, you did need that uh, in the first place. So use your judgment. And if you are, if you are larger than uh, a set of people that fit inside one room, uh, do uh, offer, uh, do uh, uh, use Act 42 to offer some of the architectural documentations. Feel free to omit certain sections, but what I would suggest is still authoring and still putting the effort and, and add at least some information uh, in sections one to three. Uh, these provide a lot of useful information for new joiners, especially as the team will grow. Uh, it's context that other people may be difficult to quite find because it's not generally documented anywhere. Uh, there are a lot of sales pitches available usually in startups, but it, it may not be enough or honest enough um, uh, that, that, that is actually beneficial to, to new joiners. So keep it lean, keep it small, document what it makes sense, add to it as time goes by, and, uh, but, but I do suggest that you use Act 42 um, even in smaller roles. And then finally, what do you do if you don't have a dedicated architect in your team? I would say still do it. It doesn't matter if you don't have someone who wears the hat of the architect. Um, go ahead and try to use a collaborative ownership uh, model. So uh, different uh, people within the team uh, updating, but not at the same time, but I mean, agree on things together, make this decision together, disseminate the responsibility of updating uh, Act 42 as a team, uh, but, but do keep around um, the, the Act 42 document uh, and, and, and gain the benefit um, that we have, can be had from architectural documentation. Uh, similarly to the uh, startup one, drop sections or uh, restrict information um, on the, in the effort that we put in different sections uh, so that it makes sense to, the, um, to your team and to your size of the team and the time that you have available, but do have something and keep it up to date. And with that, I, that's the end of the presentation. And uh, thank you very much. I, I think now it's the Q&A, yeah? Yeah, that's right. Uh, so we had a great thing that happened during your talk. So one of the authors of the Art 42, Gernot, Gernot I, uh, so, sorry if I'm not saying it right, uh, he shared with us uh, a code for, for LeanPub that allows us to download his book for free. Until the ah, nice. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm sure you didn't see that because you were, pre you were presenting, but to everyone that is on the call, I'm going to reshare that message right now. So feel free to download the books and thank you for the out, uh, to the author for that. He had to leave now, but he was saying it was a nice overview and thank you for spreading the word. Uh, okay, so that was from, uh, from, from the author. Now I have a question for the participants. I, if you have any questions and would like to discuss them with Savas, I'm, I've allowed everyone to unmute themselves now, so feel free to join us and talk, to, uh, talk and ask any questions. I, I have one to start with. Yep. I'd like to see, you know, some, some good examples of that. Uh, is, are there any, you know? Uh... Yes, so uh, the R42 book uh, contains uh, six examples, if I have five or six, I may be mistaken, but it contains examples of R42 documentation. Uh, R42, uh, so in the website, you will, you will have access to three of those examples uh, as well. Uh, and uh, they actually quite nicely demonstrate the extensible nature of R42. Um, it's, uh, you will be able to see how an R42 um, in a larger enterprise, uh, so in, uh, in, in a more regulated environment and, and with, with greater detail, uh, but also see how it's going to be, it is used in a smaller endeavor. So one of the, um, the one of the samples is about a smaller HTML checker tool um, that, uh, if I remember correctly, some of the authors uh, actually did, some of the authors of Act 42 are being implemented. So you will be able to see Act 42 in different, uh, actual samples of Act 42 in different environments. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and that is quite nice as well, yeah. I, I will say if you want to learn that, along with the uh, documentation of Act 42, 
uh, the, the, in the website that um, so the, the authors uh, also have a lot of um, uh, tips. Um, some of them I, I mean, are, are in the presentation already, so I hope that uh, some of that sounds familiar. Uh, and um, but but yeah, there, there's a lot of information there for you to uh, start using that for the tool. Yeah. Right. Thank you for that. So we have a question for Wazim. Uh, he's saying, "What's the what does the 42 in the name implies?" <laughs> I think that's the 42 that everybody knows about. <laughs> I okay. think yeah, I think that's part of the FAQ in uh, in R42. Yeah. Okay. So it does, yeah, it does refer to that thing that we all know about, yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Any more questions, people on the call? Feel free to join us and have a chat. Yeah. All right, if not, I think we'll be wrapping it up then. Uh, one, one announcement before we before we wrap up uh, we'll have another meetup on the 9th of june which is tuesday we'll be doing a workshop then about the aggregate design canvas that Savas Sava mentioned so if you have time and want to join us to do some uh, hands-on exercises then please do uh, ben is saying on the chat that he really appreciates that Savas presented this topic and it got him he's got him interested in to the games more. So I think that's good feedback. I'm also, you know, because I asked for it, I, I'm saying that I'm going, yeah, I will look into it and I think that it sounds like a useful template. Uh, for uh, people that want to ask questions, I'm a regular lurker in the DDB uh, Slack channel. Um, and I'm trying, I, I do try to be uh, actively uh, participating in that community, that community. So if you want, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, uh, write them there, and I, I, I try to uh, help as much as I can. Okay, right. So Ian, you have to admit yourself, and we can clap now. <laughs> so thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>